This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 333 of Horse Tip Daily, a different horse tip, a different equine topic, a different equestrian expert every day. Horse Tip Daily brings the world of equine knowledge to you one day at a time. Today's tip is sponsored by Equestrian Collections. Visit them at equestriancollections.com. Enjoy today's tip. Howdy, everybody. Glenn the Geek back with you from Lexington, Kentucky, and welcome back to Horse Tip Daily. Well, today we have back with us Dr. Jenny Johnson. She hasn't been around in a while, actually. She runs the Oak Hill Shockwave and Veterinary Chiropractic Clinic that's based in Calabasas, California. And she's a regular contributor to the Jumping Radio Show, which is part of the Horse Radio Network. This tip is taken off of episode number 35 and is co-hosted by Chris Stafford. You can hear the rest of the show by visiting Jumping Radio and looking for episode number 35. And we're going to be right back with Dr. Johnson's health tip right after this word from Equestrian Collections for all of your holiday shopping needs. We've been speaking a whole lot in recent weeks about looking to Equestrian Collections for all of your fall and winter needs. They have all the top brands in winter wear for you and your horse. Well, in addition to winter, believe it or not, it is now November and time to start thinking about holiday gift giving. There's no better place to find those equestrian gift ideas than at Equestrian Collections. They have thousands of choices for all of your gift giving needs at some fantastic prices. Whether it is for that guy, girl, or equine in your life, you will find it all at equestriancollections.com. And right now, you can get $10 off your next order of $120 or more just by using the coupon code STABLESCOOP at checkout. That's one word, STABLESCOOP, in the coupon code at checkout for $10 off that next order. Get that holiday shopping started early at equestriancollections.com. Yes, we're going to start uh, sort of a new segment or a new uh, series here or a continuation of our series, really. We'll be talking about the determination, grading, and characterization of lameness over the next several uh, sessions. Well, it sounds very complex, but I'm sure you're able to unravel it and make it uh, very understandable for us. Well, I hope so. T- today we'll, we'll talk initially about the basic steps that are necessary uh, to determine, grade, and characterize a lameness. There are six basic steps and that, that should be determined when you're looking at a lameness. The first thing and most important, which would be obvious, is to determine what is the primary or baseline lameness or lameness is. And while considering this, the second aspect of that is considering the possibility of involvement of more than one limb or, and or the presence of the compensatory lameness. Now, the third aspect would be classifying the lameness as to whether it's a supporting limb lameness or a swinging uh, lameness or a mixed lameness, and we'll talk more about that uh, as we go through this information. The fourth aspect would be what's called grading the lameness, which is uh, establishing the degree of severity with some level of consistent terminology. The fifth aspect would be evaluating the lameness for an alteration of the cranial or caudal phase of the stride. And the last aspect we would consider would be the presence or absence of abnormal limb flight as part of the lameness. Now, the first thing that I mentioned would be establishing the, you know, what is the primary or baseline lameness. And how we define that is that this is the gait or abnormality that is present prior to any flexion test or manipulation by your veterinarian. This is the lameness that the veterinarian will try to block with the diagnostic nerve blocks. Now, if there's lameness in more than one limb, that may complicate finding the limb that ha- is the worst in terms of lameness. Now, another aspect that we need to consider when looking at a lame horse is that the horse may travel differently at the walk and the trot. Now, it's important to always evaluate a horse at the trot when you're evaluating for lameness. The only exception to that would be if you think that there's a possibility the horse may have a fracture. In that case, of course, you would not want to jog the horse. But in all other cases, you would want to walk and jog the horse. Now, an example of a situation where a horse may travel considerably differently at the walk versus the trot is a horse with scratches or caudal pastern dermatitis, the dermatitis in the back of the pastern. Those horses may walk with a very shortened stride, but they'll trot fine. Usually the variation between walk and trot is a matter of degree of lameness, not a, a different limb. Now, you also have to evaluate in what 
uh, capacity, the horse appears most lame. In other words, the horse may appear sound at the walk and trot in hand, but may appear lame in the circle. And this is how you have to characterize the baseline lameness. And this is the context in which the evaluation should be performed. In other words, when you do your diagnostic nerve blocks, if the horse is most lame on a circle, then that's how you would want to evaluate the effectiveness of the nerve blocks. So I want to talk a little bit about compensatory lamenesses. Those are lamenesses that result from overloading of the other limbs as a result of the primary lameness. And it's important to recognize that this happens over time, not instantly. And the reason I mention that is that it's important to differentiate a compensatory lameness from the stride-to-stride gait alteration by a horse to avoid interference because of the gait deficit or lameness. In other words, a horse that's lame is going to alter their gait so they don't hurt themselves. That is not a compensatory lameness. A compensatory lameness is uh, a result of overloading of the other limbs, which happens over time. Now, if it is a stride-to-stride gait alteration as a function of avoiding uh, interference because of another lameness, this alteration will go away when the primary lameness is abolished with a diagnostic nerve block. When you have a compensatory lameness, it's often hard to know which lameness came first. And it's important to know how horses compensate and which limbs would be at risk. There are certain fairly consistent patterns that are uh, present in horses with specific lamenesses that may result in other compensatory lamenesses. The most common of these is a bilateral forelimb lameness or a bilateral hindlimb lameness. The horses that have a specific lameness in one forelimb are at risk for developing the same condition in the opposite forelimb. This is the most common compensatory lameness. And it may not always be a compensatory lameness. It may be a result of a simultaneous injury. It may be a result of a degenerative process in the bony structure that's common in both forelimbs or both structures, uh, or it could be a result of shoeing that's similar on both front feet, but not uh, ideal for the horse and, and resulting in a lameness. So usually when you have a bilateral forelimb lameness, you'll have a short choppy stride, and when, you, when one forelimb is blocked out, the lameness is blocked out, they'll usually become lame on the other forelimb. And the same in the hind limb if you have a bilateral lameness. You'll have a short choppy stride, you block one out, the other one becomes more lame. Now, suspensory resmias or inflammation of the suspensory is a common compensatory lameness uh, in the opposite limb uh, to the primary lameness. In jumpers, for example, with a left forelimb lameness, right front suspensory desmitis is common. So you end up with a horse with a, a lameness in the left front it's not unlikely or not out of the question they will end up with a suspensory injury on the right front. And uh, it's, it makes common sense because the soft tissue structures are particularly vulnerable to that overload uh, effect from having a forelimb lameness in the opposite leg. It is also possible that you can have a compensatory lameness develop in the same leg. For example, a horse that has a front foot lameness, you may also frequently find that their suspensory is sore. So that's a little bit about compensatory lamenesses as well as how the variations work with that. I want to talk a little bit briefly about supporting versus swinging lamenesses. A lot of people will talk a great deal about whether a lameness is a supporting lameness or a swinging lameness, and I don't think that it's really possible to adequately characterize a lameness in this way. But I will make an effort to define it so that if our listeners hear the terminology, they're familiar with what it means. A supporting limb lameness is a lameness that is painful during the weight-bearing phase of the stride. Most lamenesses are of this type. Whereas a swinging leg lameness describes a lameness that primarily affects the way the horse carries the lame leg. However, most horses that are lame will alter the swing phase of the stride in a typical and predictable fashion. So therefore, it's really difficult to clearly separate a supporting and a swinging phase of stride lameness. I think a more correct way to use the terminology, particularly for a swinging leg lameness, would be to use that term only in the case of mechanical gait deficits. In other words, there's no manifestation of pain, but there is a mechanical abnormality in the gait. And examples of this would be fibrotic myopathy, uh, upward fixation of the patella, or string halt. 
And I think most, most lamenesses would be considered mixed lamenesses. And that's, I think I will uh, stop our discussion for this topic right here. And that's, that gives our listeners sort of some general ideas of what they want to be thinking about when they have a horse that's lame. These are the areas that are going to be considered and evaluated when they have the horse evaluated by the veterinarian. And just general information that they should be thinking about in their head uh, when they're looking at a horse that they feel may have a lameness issue. Wonderful, Jen. I mean, that's really, really instructive. And uh, as you know, I'm particularly fond of these segments. I learned so much from you. And thank you so much for unraveling that for us this week. And um, next time you come back, uh, you're going to continue in this series? Yes, we are. We're going to be continuing uh, with this series where we're talking about determining the location of lameness, talking about forelimb versus hind limb and how those sometimes can be a bit confusing to differentiate. Terrific. All right. Well, look forward to that, Jenny. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Chris. It's always a pleasure. Well, thank you to Chris Stafford and to Dr. Johnson for providing that tip from the Jumping Radio Show, episode number 35. That's Jumping Radio, episode number 35. Check it out at jumpingradio.com. Well, we'll be back again tomorrow with another new expert and a different horse tip. Until then, don't forget, 9 a.m. Monday morning, it's time for Horses in the Morning Live here on the Horse Radio Network. Between 9 and 10.30 a.m. Eastern Time, you can catch us at HorsesInTheMorning.com. I think tomorrow we will be talking about uh, Zenyatta and her unfortunate loss yesterday. But also, we'll be talking about lottery. If you won the lottery, what would you do? We'd love to hear the horse person's perspective of that. So give us a call at HorsesInTheMorning.com, 9 a.m. Monday morning. Have a great ride, everybody, and be safe. The Horse Radio Network and the Horse Radio Network hosts are not responsible for statements of guests or their opinions. Use your own judgment when listening to the tips provided by the experts on Horse Tip Daily. 